God is my life and saving help, I shall not be afraid. I'm going to move out to the middle for a change just to be in a different spot and see people differently. <clears throat> when I started to think about this scripture reading, I thought that I would give you the treat of your lives and tell you all about my call to ministry. It was not like Cheryl's telephone call, but it could be just as funny. And then I was reminded of a study done about 12 years ago in the United States, but I think it applied to Canadians too, by the Lilly Foundation. Now, this is a group that provides money for research in terms of helping churches and ministers form better relationships. It's, it's quite an interesting foundation. They did a survey about congregations and ministers and the word call. And they found that for ministers, it's very important stuff. And we cherish it and we talk about it at any time that we can get a chance to. But they found that most of the people in the pews are bored to death with it. I don't think it's simply because you're not interested in what happened to me or Cheryl or all the other ministers that I could name. But what they found in their research was that for most of you, outside of your time in church, the term call has very little relevance. You don't see your job. You don't see that pile of laundry that you got to wash. You don't see the boss who's waiting for the report as being part of God's call. That's your job. Can I let you in on a secret? Sometimes ministers think the same thing about the work they do. There's a real difference between call or vocation and the tasks that we do. Most of us, most of the time, I think, feel that we're not James and John or Peter or Andrew, all those characters who get named in the book, not even Chloe or, or any of the others. We're more like Zebedee. You remember who Zebedee was? He was the father. Now, what happened to poor Zebedee? The boys walked off and left him with the boat and the business, and it's his problem. And sometimes I think that's the way we feel when we think about our call. We're the ones that got left behind. There's an ancient rabbinical story about Zebedee. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much truth it's in it, but it's part of the stuff that comes down to us. After James and John left, Zebedee sat there on his boat for a while. Now, you need to realize that Zebedee was actually a fairly wealthy fisherman. He might have even had more than one boat. Certainly, he had people who were employed by him to, to do the fishing. He was not the bottom end of the economic scale. But his plan had been to retire. And guess who was going to take over? Those two that just went down the road. I can imagine him going home. This isn't in the rabbinical tale, but trying to tell his wife what happened to the boys. They went off with who? For how long? Are they coming back? Anyway, the story is that Zebedee fell into a deep funk, the blues, and finally went to see his rabbi. And the rabbi had also been a friend of Jesus because Jesus had been in Capernaum for quite a while and they'd talked and they'd studied and, and the rabbi said, Zebedee, what's wrong? You seem depressed. And Zeb said, I am. My boy's left and I'm left holding the boat. The rabbi said, yeah, I know that feeling. Jesus was a good friend of mine and I wanted to go with him too, but 
I got a wife and four daughters to marry off and a synagogue to run, and I, I just can't. I couldn't go with him. And Zebedee said, that's, that's how I feel. I got all this responsibility for these people who depend on me to provide fish, nourishment for their bodies. I've got people who are employed by me. What am I supposed to do? I'm not going to tell you the punchline. Because what I learned in listening to that story is that it, the business about being called is not about going to a job. Much as I like to think ministry is a calling, I'm going to quit trying to use that word. It's a job. It's a, it's a thing that I do in response to the call that I got. The first call that any one of us gets is to be in relationship with Jesus. To have that conversation back and forth with that, that one who brings us a glimpse of God's presence. We're invited, first of all, into a relationship with Jesus. And that's where the calling begins. The second thing that happens comes to me when I think about James and John and Andrew and Peter and all the rest of them. Eventually, when they get, quote, called by Jesus to follow, they become a community. A community of folk who are journeying with this one they're all in relationship with. They're journeying with Jesus. They become, in a sense, one body, the church. That's our call, our second part of the call, to gather with like-minded folk who will walk with us and wrestle with us and struggle with us on that journey to follow Jesus. And the things that happen on that journey the stuff that happens when we get up in the morning and greet our partner with a scowl and a snarl because we had a bad night and our partner says, I love you anyway. Or when we go to work and the boss says, you're late. Or the teacher says, we're having a pop quiz. Or whatever happens. All through the rest of the days and the weeks of our lives, in relationship with Jesus, in relationship with the church, the community, we are in relationship with God's creation. And living out that relationship is the call that God offers to every one of us. You are all called. It's not just Cheryl who gets a phone call every day from God. It's each one of you who gets a call from God every single day to follow in that community of faith and to live out that faith life wherever you go. You are God's ministers. And it might lead you to be a piano teacher for the rest of your life. Perish the thought of all those little kids who can't quite get the scales right, huh? It might cause you to be a secretarial type who's trying like mad to make your fingers to go where the words on your head are saying they should go instead of where they end up. Or to balance the books in a business. Or to take care of a sick person. The calling is to a relational life with Christ, with people of faith, and with the world around us. What the Lilly Foundation discovered is that that's probably the hardest thing for most people in the pews to imagine. So I'm going to invite you to take up your ministry for just a minute.
And then you can take it with you as homework for the next week. I would like you to think of one person that you have a relationship with. It can be a good relationship, a bad relationship, a tenuous relationship, an intimate, whatever. One person. And I want you to take just a minute right now and as you think about that person and name them in your head and your heart, I want you to offer up a prayer for them. And having prayed for them, you will engage in a relationship with them in this next week. And you will be different because you prayed for them. And they will be changed because of you. Take that ministry with you. The ministry of relating to the very people around you who need to be in relationship with you and with others and with God. The saddest news I see on our world is about people who are lonely, lost, alienated, and have no connections to anyone. They live in despair. They're discouraged. Frederick Buechner once said that vocation ministry is where your deep passion meets the world's deep need. And there's nothing this world needs more than, an, than a relationship in love and hope and trust. Carry the one for whom you pray with you this week. For that is our common vocation. May it be so. Amen. When I chose, when I chose the next hymn, I had a sermon going in a di different direction. And yet the more I think about this him and the words in it, I realize it's part of the invitation to relationship that we all carry, and that we all receive from God. The hymn is God of the Sparrow from Voices United at 229 and on the screen. <laughs>